All right, so it's a pleasure to uh, speak here about uh, chemistry and second life. This is actually quite a treat for me. It's the first time that uh, I meet Andy in uh, real life, even though we've been collaborating for a long time. And most of what you're going to see here is a collaboration between he and I. So just to put things into context here a little bit, um, you know, we've seen a number of tools being used in education. And the thing we have to remember is that you know, our role as a chemistry teacher is to teach chemistry. So we don't want to use tools just simply for the sake of using tools. And oftentimes, people don't understand Second Life because they haven't seen a good application in an educational context. So hopefully today, you'll get to see a few things that maybe you didn't know about Second Life, and that might get you interested. But we're definitely interested in the educational aspect of this. Uh, just a little background on where I'm coming from. Um, I started to record my lectures, and I'm not going to go into any detail here, just simply to say that I found this to be effective enough that uh, my students, you know, just stopped coming to my lectures. And when I looked at the performance of students who came versus those who just watched my recordings, they were the same. And so I, I decided to assign my recorded lectures, and instead of doing lecturing during class time, I would use it for workshops. So Second Life is just one of the things that I do in my workshops with my organic chemistry students. Now before Second Life, I actually used games like Unreal Tournament, it's a first person shooter game. It actually comes with a version that's educational that has no weapons. And uh, this is what this looks like here. Students basically go around in these mazes and then they click on these doors and if it's correct, they move through. If it's incorrect, you know, they get penalized somehow. When there's weapons, of course, you can have them die. But uh, <laughs> So I would probably still be using this if I hadn't come across Second Life because you can do much the same thing uh, without weapons so far. Uh, it, but instead of rooms, actually, we use these obelisks. And when you click on them, you get these four same images. So I was able to repurpose the content that I used uh, in my uh, games. And uh, the students are still able to go through this. So this is one of the ways. This is actually how I got involved with Second Life, uh, using it to, to deliver quizzes. So in my classes, students will come at a given time, and there will be all these obelisks. They'll click on them. And if they keep getting the questions right, they keep moving forward. If they get any of them wrong, they have to start over. So I'm able to run these races with students. And the first one to finish will get a molecular model kit. So I don't give out grades in this context. It's just an additional motivation for students. And I don't require my students to use Second Life. So that's another thing that I believe in pretty strongly. If you want to have a positive experience, you want it to come naturally from the students just engaging in the technology. Another kind of interaction, uh, and this is where Andy comes in more, is uh, I have some students for a very small amount of extra credit do projects in Second Life. So I teach organic chemistry. Obviously, that would mean 3D molecules in Second Life, right? It's a 3D virtual uh, environment. And it turns out that, uh, especially lately, with a lot of the work that Andy's done, it's become extremely easy to make these 3D molecules. And they're also minimized. So the student basically as I'll show you in a little bit, or Annie will show you, uh, has a way of you know, typing in the molecule and not having to be worried about how is it getting minimized, how is it building the thing in 3D. So there's no scripting at all involved. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to jump in at this point. Let's see. Uh, what's the next one? Talk about this one, and then I'll So this is just another example where this is a, a larger poster. And this, this is a, an SN1 reaction with a ring expansion. So we go from a four-membered ring to a five-membered ring. And this is something that's you know, very difficult to show on paper. It's one of the hardest things that I find to show you know, what happens when you get a one-two shift and there's a ring expansion. So because you, know, you can use 3D in Second Life, it's just an additional way of conveying that, that, con that concept. Okay, here, John Claude and I actually are meeting for the first time today. We've been collaborating for 18 months on Second Life. Uh, this, we actually met on uh, Second Nature, which is the island, uh, the British Journal Nature has an island, and we've uh, since uh, emigrated onto uh, ACS Island. But here's a picture of uh, John Claude and one of his students flying around uh, Second Nature on molecules. You can actually uh, do all, all sorts of things with these molecules, take them and <coughs> rotate them, and you can wear them and fly around, go inside, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, 
you want to explain ChemSpider? So if you're not familiar with it, ChemSpider is a fantastic uh, free online database that has over 20 million molecules. And what it enables you to do is to draw the structure and then get the um, SMILES code or the INCHI code or some representation that's in text format. That way we can just copy from ChemSpider and we can dump it into ND's Reser and that's where that whole process starts. Maybe you want to talk about that, the web services you use? Yeah, could we try and show the video? Let's try to show a little video. Yeah, what we do, um, I have a, I scripted a Reser, so now all you, all you have to do is go to ChemSpider, look up the chemical identifier, type it into chat. No, it's not, it's not going to work. That's okay, we're going to be demonstrating Second Life uh, later on today in another location. But I have a Reza to create these molecules. A student doesn't have to do any scripting. They just go to ChemSpider, copy the identifier into chat in Second Life, hit enter, the uh, Reza listens to their chat, goes and queries uh, several web service out, services out there, three ones. Uh, ChemSpider has a couple that I uh, ping, and then Rajashi Guha at uh, Indiana has a and the minimizer that returns the minimized structure. And they return that to my reser in Second Life and it actually creates that molecule right in front of them within 30 seconds. So yeah, again, we're, you know, unfortunately we weren't able to show the video, but we'll be happy to meet with you individually uh, to, to, to show you how to do that. So the other component of this that I've used in my, in my class is the you know, coupling with spectra, especially NMR spectra. So the way that we used to do it is basically just, you know, you put the molecule and then you can just paste the spectrum as an image. So that's very easy to do in Second Life, or images. But uh, Andy's done something recently which is very exciting where you have an interactive NMR spectrum in Second Life and you actually talk to it. So you tell it to, in, the, in the chat to actually zoom. So we say zoom 2.1 to 2.3 ppm and then it will expand the peaks. And that's actually very nice, you can imagine, from a, a standpoint of interacting with your students and having them, you know, select. Yeah, this is, uh, Second Life actually has uh, good tools for accessing stuff outside of Second Life. So I actually wrote the uh, script in PHP here, and I can take any of the spectra files, uh, store them on my web server, and <coughs> access them from Second Life, and it uh, actually uh, numerically does the integration also. And we use a JCAMP format, which is again a nice open format for spectra and we're able with exactly the same files to display our spectra in an interactive format over a browser. So you know I, I highly highly recommend uh, the JCAMP uh, format and JSpecView is the program the, for the browser. So a, a, a number of additional things that we've done uh, to demonstrate chemistry concepts. This is an example of docking uh, where we have a, a, a molecules, I, I work in uh, to make anti-malarial compounds and we've basically done, done docking uh, against some malarial enzymes, I think this one is eno oil reductase and the idea is to show in, using the full 3D capabilities of Second Life how a small molecule docks into a receptor site. Now in order for, to, to, to be able to show this you know, and, and still have it make sense, this is not the entire uh, enzyme obviously, this is just the receptor part. So. You have anything to say about that? Uh, this was uh, really where we began collaborating. Um, we sort of bumped into each other on Second Life, and uh, I created my molecule Reza just as a, uh, an assignment for myself to learn the scripting language in Second Life. And I met Jean Claude in Second Life, and he says, Hey, can you create this molecule? So I said, Sure. And then we, you know, he gave me the code, and out popped the molecule. He said, Wow, I wonder, could we show docking? I said, Hmm, probably, let's give it a try, and then this is, this is the result. So this is also an animation in Second Life that you can see, and on YouTube we have one also. There are a number of people who are working on visualizing, so just to pick one of them, Peter Miller. Uh, so this is a representation of actually the entire enzyme. And the thing is, in Second Life, the more details you, you use, you use up prims, which is the fundamental unit. And if you use them all up, you know, you don't have enough to do other things on your island. So it's very important to have different levels of approximation. So here we're not looking at every atom, we're looking at you know, a somewhat abbreviated view of the, of the enzyme. And another <coughs> very, very abbrevi uh, abbreviated way, uh, maybe you want to say you do this? Sure, With the uh, one limitation of Second Life, as Jean-Claude mentioned, is you're limited to the number of 
prims, they're called, that you can display on a single island. And so when you want to create a, a big, big pro team, that's really difficult. And so what uh, we talked about doing and we su uh, succeeded is taking, just uh, typing into chat um, a particular PDB file. It goes off, queries it, and then I wrote another PHP script that will actually create the surface and uh, return that to Second Life. And this is beautiful because it's only one prim. It's the smallest possible unit. And this only looks at the surface of the enzyme. But sometimes that's all you really want to do, right? You don't necessarily need to see every amino acid. Then as I was developing this, uh, there's Hex uh, 5.0, which I found is a free program out there. And uh, this is uh, the molecule that actually John claude is working with, uh, Faustapane 2. And, uh, and so that's a single prim, which was a... Uh, when we uh, created that, we were quite excited that you could create a, a full protein like that with just a single prim. So some other things that we've done is to actually talk to molecules and have them react with each other. I think this is, this is a nice little thing that you can do with your students. Here we have uh, an amine and an aldehyde form, forming an imine. There are three steps to that, right? You gotta add them, and then you gotta lose water. So basically, when you talk to them in the chat, you say next or back, and every one of the intermediates is actually minimized. So it's a realistic shape of what it actually looks like. And it's very different than when you draw it on paper. On paper, everything is flat, but in fact, it's very obvious when you, know, when you do this that you know, one of the intermediates is flat, but the other structures are you know, all, at all kinds of angles. Here, yeah, um also, with, I, have a, I teach a mathematical physics at Oral Roberts, and so I have an honor student that I was working with, and um, as a project, we created the uh, hydrogen uh, orbitals um, uh, that we're actually uh, releasing. Uh, they're going to be freely available. So here are the, uh, some, some picture, screenshots of those. Another thing that uh, I did with my student is here is uh, we created a an exhibit to show the uh, visible hydrogen absorption spectrum. Uh, this is interactive. You can actually click on the light source and the, the light will turn off and then the uh, spectra will disappear. Um, and also the uh, hydrogen orbitals will stop jumping up into excited states. When you turn the, lights back, the light back on, the orbitals start jumping up into excited states and then when they uh, jump back down, re they release the photons of the particular wavelengths and the uh, spectra appears on the screen too. This is another one uh, that we created showing the selection rules. Uh, this is interactive too. The yellow box is the current selected state and it shows the uh, green states of the allowed uh, transitions. And you can click on the green one or red one to select a new state and it will di dynamically change and show up uh, all the transition rules. <coughs> This is uh, our latest stuff, actually. Uh, John claude has uh, had a little robot did all a whole sequence of experiments and uh, stored that in a Google spreadsheet. And uh, we're working with part of uh, general data visualization, not just chemistry visualization. So his uh, data was, uh, was five-dimensional, uh, had five uh, degrees of freedom. So we uh, represented that in Second Life, um, showing the results for a whole sequence of experimentation. You want to say what the experiment was? Yeah, this is a Yugi reaction, and we were just basically looking at, you know, the excess of some of the reagents. So the different colors represent, you know, which reagent was in excess, and uh, going up was the concentration. So, you know, very quickly, and this is a three-dimensional object that you can rotate as well for, for convenience. So the larger the objects, the larger the yield. And so you can see here that, you know, this is methanol, or the spheres, ethanol are the cubes and THF is these little triangles so you can very very quickly grasp what's going on in that whole five-dimensional space so I think this this is something that I'm very excited about for Second Life because it does permit that 3D that's uh, missing on paper so just skip through a few of these because sure. we're running out of time okay the uh, we started working with the ACS and they actually sponsored a lot of these things that we're talking about today and one thing they sponsored was the uh, a three-dimensional periodic table uh, that you can actually uh, get this for free and, and use it in your uh, classes. You can the, uh, you click on each uh, atom and it tells you information about what it is. 
And on, I have actually set up Drexel Island, and you know, there's all kinds of things you can do. We don't have time to get into. You can have little office places. Um, you, I, you know, have a place to set up the lab with my students. We can also run conferences. And actually, I'll be giving another talk at 4:25 this afternoon on how to use networking in Second Life. So how to meet people, how to get jobs, and things like that. So I'll be talking about conferences. As ACS Islands. Last uh, meeting, we actually had 20 posters from the SciMix in uh, ACS Island, and that was that was pretty pretty nice. Uh, and it's new museum. Yeah, um, one work that we've uh, done recently, uh, sponsored by Sigma Aldrich and the Chemical Heritage Foundation, is the, we built an interactive museum in Second Life, and um, here's a HIV exhibit. The uh, it's fully interactive with videos and molecules and proteins and the HIV virion right there you can play with. Uh, for uh, the GII initiative, we also have a red tide exhibit. Here's a fertilizer runoff from a cornfield. Uh, we have dissolved uh, oxygen uh, stations down the river. And you get to the beach and, and it's closed. You can't get any of the shellfish from the beach because they've all been uh, killed with the neurotoxins. Underneath, you can go underneath the water and you can watch uh, videos and PowerPoints about dead zones and red tides. Uh, they, they have an underwater lab with a fish there also. Uh, on ACS Island, there's a resident chemist program. So if you really want to get into Second Life, uh, the ACS is offering free space for you to do so. Uh, Hinostroza Lab, uh, Gus Rosania Lab, uh, Kurt Winkleman has a virtual lab there. Uh, Joan uh, Slonczewski has an excellent, uh, she created interactive uh, exhibits. You click on these and pieces drop off and tell you what they are. It's amino world, it's very cool. Yeah, so uh, like I said, with, uh, at uh, 425 I'm giving a talk and at 3 o'clock uh, at the ACS at Pavilion. The, at the Pavilion we'll actually be demonstrating Second Life. Uh, if you want to come see how it really works and how we create more.